welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming along today. We really appreciate it for today's session, uh, lunch and learn session on the bulk dozer push. And I'll hand over to Ted, who's going to be speaking today. Thanks very much, Hannah. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, the format today is going to be um, pretty casual, have a bite to eat. I'll talk for about 20 minutes, half an hour. Uh, if you've got any questions at all on the way through or anything you want to veer off on a tangent and discuss, that's fine. Just jump in and, and we'll have a chat. There'll be a bit of time for questions at the end. If anyone's got to leave before that, that's fine. Um, attendance is not compulsory. <laughs> um, so feel free to leave whenever you want. Um, Toilets, if you, if you need them, you just have to go back out the door and there to cross the hall and to the left for the boys, right for the girls. Um, help yourself to as much food as you want. If you need to get up and during the presentation, that's fine and won't be offended at all. Just um, make sure you don't leave anything left over for the, for the guys in there. It's <laughs> 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 all right, that's all right, they'll be around. <laughs> So I'll just introduce myself quickly, um, Ted's my name, but um, I've got about 15, 16 years of um, mining experience. I'm a, a mining engineer. Uh, pretty much all of my career so far has been in, um, in open cut coal, and most of that's been strip mining. So I've sort of done the dozers, drag lines, cast blasting, um, so forth, all, sort of, all to death. Um, so that's why I'm up here talking to you today. The photo in the background is a mine that I worked at once where we did a lot of, lot of bulk push and we ended up getting a pit that we split in half. The drag line got shoved into one end and um, eight dozers went in the other end and it was, became a bit of a competition as to whether the dozers could beat the drag line as far as cost and uncovery goes and they got pretty close. What was that, Ted? Uh, that was Aki Creek. <coughs> Good times. So we'll start out slowly. I'll go through some of the basics of dozer push then I'll, I'll warm up and I'll go through a few um, sort of concepts that'll hopefully um, help you think about how to improve it um, and we'll just finish off with a few thoughts about how to implement if you're currently not running it um, but you want to, to bring it in and make it successful. So there's three main segments of, of the push. Uh, the first one is cut. Um, so in the cut phase you want to fill the blade as quickly as possible. Um, to do that, to make the blade more aggressive the blade gets tilted forward. Um, and, the, and dropped, and that basically pulls the material up into the blade as quickly as possible. The next component is the, the slide and carry. So to carry the material, the blade's then tilted back, <coughs> and what that does is that makes the, the bottom of the blade slide on the material rather than the, the rolling rock sliding on the material as you go along. So the last... Um, Last one in the sequence is the dumping. Um, in certain circumstances, there's an advantage to tilt the blade back forward again. It gives you a small additional movement of, um, you know, you might get an extra metre or so centroid movement out of your material without actually tracking any further up, up the pit. So I'll just go back one slide. So what you want to see, when the material's being carried, what you should see is um, no rolling of the material. So in the top of the blade, that material should be static. So you should be able to look down out of the cab and see the same little piece of rock sitting there and not moving. Um, as distinct from the cutting, what you'll see at the top of the blade is that material is rolling up the blade and over, kind of like a wave. Uh, so that's an easy way when you're sitting on a high wall watching a dozer push operation to see whether they're doing the appropriate blade tilting, is if you can see the material moving on the top of the blade, then they're not carrying the dirt um, <laughs> as efficiently as that. I don't know. What do you reckon the price is? <laughs> <laughs> so to put those in perspective, um, so to dig to get it to cut in, you're about halfway through the tilt, fully laid back to carry and to dump, tilt the blade forward as far as possible and that just moves the pile um, a little bit further forward than you get by, by tracking it forward. So some of the basics of geometry, the, the very basic premise is um, the use of pivot point. Um, typically that's the intersection of a line from the edge of your coal edge up to hit the blast profile. And the idea is if you cut one side and you fill the other side, you're not doing any rehandle. So you've got the most efficient prime movement of material from one side to the other. So this, is, this has been the accepted thinking for a long time. 
Um, but we'll go through a few variations on this where you can perhaps make it a little bit more efficient by, by varying this theme. So breaking it down, uh, you don't push all the material in one go. Typically it's a combination, of, it's a sequence of slices. So you'll start at the top and you'll push down each time aiming to go through the pivot and, and out the other side of the pivot. In reality, however, there's a distinct advantage in pushing the, the top material down rather than pushing it out all the way down into the, into the tip is to use a tip head method. So typically the top material, and usually this cutoff grade here is somewhere in the order of 20%, where you'll push the material down instead of doing that in a number of slices, you'll do it in one go, pushing on that plane. The material basically reels down to the bottom. So instead of having to push it all the way down, it's, it's doing half the job for you, it's reeling down. So you'll tip head down until you get to a certain grade. 20% is a good figure to use. Once you get under that, this second one here will be done in a number of slices. Um, and you're incrementally pushing. Um, so those stacks on the bottom are basically coming off the top. And then you're stacking up above it as you, as you keep working down. So you're working, working in slices for the bottom bit, working in one big chunk for the top bit. So that's just using gravity as much as you can on the top of the blast to get that material down without pushing the extra distance. So to work out when to stop, there's a, there's a number of tools around that, that help you do this. Um, the one that most people use is the Caterpillar Dose Sim or, um, or the tables that you can get out of the CAT handbook. What Caterpillar do is they've got a nice little sand pit set up in um, wherever their factory is, I forget, where they, they do some dozing and they record for various distances and grades what the production was. So the idea is that that sand pit is the best possible conditions you could ever get. It's all nicely fragmented, everything's perfect. Um, they then apply a bunch of factors to that um, to account for the material, the swell, the operator, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, to get it back to the, to the production. So the idea is run the material through the calculator. Typically it works on centroid, so you take your centroid of your last push to the centroid of your uh, dump, um, gives you an average push cost for that last slice. So incrementally you, you would design slices underneath and work out the cost of each slice by using the calculator. A few things to keep in mind. Um, working out when to cut off your dozer push is really a balance between um, what will be the cost to move that dirt if I don't do it with my dozer push and typically truck shovels the, is the alternate method. So looking on the top there, truck shovel cost is really controlled by the haul distance, uh, which is not going to be constant through the blast profile. At the top of the blast profile, um, if you had chosen to take that with truck shovel, you probably would have hauled it around the top of the pit. Not a lot of elevation change. It's going to be relatively cheap. As you get further down the pit, you're having to elevate that material up. The haul cycles get longer and the truck shovel cost gets higher. So keeping that into a mi in, in mind, there's a big variation in truck shovel cost as well. So you can't sort of just say, yeah, my truck shovel cost is $3 because it, it actually varies through the profile. So the best way to get a handle on that is just to run some haul profiles for your top dirt, middle dirt, bottom dirt uh, to try and figure out what my actual cutoff is going to be for that dirt. Then for the dozers, you can run a, a slice for each bit of material, run it through your dozer calculator, um, work out the productivity, which will give you the dollars per BCM, um, and compare it. And that way you can get um, a really good handle on what your cutoff is. One thing to keep in mind too is while we've done this on, on whole slices, um, obviously the distance, the push distance for the material close to the pivot is a lot less than the push distance for the material at the high wall. So while it's fine to sort of cut it down in slices like that, um, once, you, once you get down to the bottom, you're in a situation where what you may want to do is start leaving material on the high wall and in preference take material closer to the pivot to cut the, the push distance down. Um, so the only way I've found really that's, that's good at working that out is just to iteratively do it. Um, typically I'd cut it up into slices first, I'd work out your costs, work out which of these levels is the cutoff level, and then I would say, can you beat that? Can you swap a bit of material on the high wall for a bit of extra material under the pivot and, and push some more material that way? Often what you'll find 
So deviating from the standard pivot point definition, so this, in this case here, this is my blast profile, the standard pivot point would be, would be there. What you'll find in some circumstances, particularly where you've got high dips on the coal, um, you'll find that uh, you're, you're very dump room constrained. There's just not enough dump room to push as much material as you'd like. In that situation, it, it does pay sometimes to lift the pivot, uh, which means you're no, longer, um, you're no longer pushing every BCM to prime, but you've created a lot of extra dump room. So for example, if the pivot was down there, your final surface would be there. So you lifted the pivot to there, your final surface has gone up, so you've created all that extra dump room for that bit of rehandle. So you continue to lift it as far as you want. Eventually you get to a situation where the rehandle's not worth it anymore. Um, I find that in terms of vertical meters, normally two to three meters up actually translates a long way to the left. Um, is, a, is about where they usually end up. Um, but I'd probably try it every metre until you, until you get the answer that you want. You'll find that um, this certainly doesn't suit every pit. Uh, a lot of pits, the, the optimal scenario is just using the standard pivot. Um, so it's, it's really anywhere. Typically, um, pits that have got high dips, pits where you might have dumped some parting back in the pit so the, the truck shovel have already used up some of your room. Um, pits where your cast has been really, really high, if you've filled that whole thing up with cast, um, you may want to lift your pivot just to make enough room for some dozer push in there. So they're the situations where you look at it. So let's have a look at um, what the limiting factor is at various stages of the push. So when you're... Oh, wrong button. So go, when you're pushing downhill, you've got this lovely gravity force helping the dozer go down. You've got the tractive force that the dozer grouses through the engine are, are applying on the ground. Um, and you've got a friction force underneath the blade which is kind of holding it all back. Because of the weight component of the dozer, the, the power of the machine you know, sort of runs roughshod over, over the friction forces when you're pushing downhill. So if you, could, if you could physically fit more material in that blade, the machine would have enough grunt to push it downhill. So the limiting factor in downhill push is just the, just the square um, you know, metres area of the blade, basically. Once you're on the flat, the limiting factor starts to become the, the tractive force balancing the friction. Um, so the actual amount of force that the, that the, the tracks, the grousers can apply to the ground doesn't really change whether you're pushing downhill, uphill or, or flat. It's, it's got the same amount of horsepower, the grousers have got the same amount of grip, What's changing is the friction on the blade and then the weight component of the dozer going downhill. So what's happened when this dozer's flattened out and is, and is pushing flat, the amount of dirt that can be carried in that blade... Oh, hey Sean. You're all right, mate. Have a seat. Grab a sandwich. The amount of dirt that you can fit in the blade is being limited by the friction uh, between the material in the blade and the friction on, the, on, your, on your surface. So what the operator is doing is, the operator is very subtly bringing the blade up and down slightly to vary the amount of load in the blade so that the, the grouses don't slip, basically. So when you're pushing uphill, the same thing applies, but all of a sudden now you're working also against the dozer's weight. So the amount of um, tractive force that you've got um, a lot of that's being used up pushing the weight of the dozer uphill and less of it's being used up overcoming friction, which means the operator has to drop more load out of the blade to, to keep the machine moving. So what does all that mean? So to push downhill, if you had a bigger blade, like my little animation there, <coughs> you could push more material. When you're pushing uphill, what you really want to be doing is carrying the blade. You want to be reducing the friction between the, the material and, and the surface that it's sliding on. So to do that, what you're really doing is inserting more metal in there. So the force of that material is being carried on the blade and less on the ground. Um, so that's going to reduce that friction and mean that you can put more material in the blade. So the, the solution is basically is a large carry blade. Um, there's a few dozers that are designed for that. Carry dozers is exactly that premise. That's, that's how they were designed. 
Um, and there's a whole bunch of aftermarket blades that you can get, the Komatsu iMac blades, the spade blades and so forth that, that are basically designed around that premise. So they've got maximum square metres, they're big blades, but they also protrude a lot on the bottom which carries the material. Um, and typically, you know, compared to a standard U-blade, um, typically you're at 20, 25% difference in productivity um, when you're looking at one of these um, um, purpose-built blades. So just to have a look at the difference, um, up the top left, that's a standard U-blade, and that's a, that's a spade blade. And you can see the difference in, um, in surface area of that blade. Uh, basically carries a lot more material downhill. The little bit on the bottom there juts out, um, and that carries the, the weight of the material stop the, to reduce the friction as you're going uphill. Um, that picture there, that's a carry dozer on the left, and that's a, you can really tell them, so there's a spade blade on the right. So what, what happens when we're pushing downhill and back uphill using those principles that we just talked about? As we're pushing downhill, big blade load, we get onto the flat, the operator has to drop a bit of material out because he hasn't got the gravity, he or she hasn't got the gravity to help anymore. Pushing uphill, the blade load's gotten even smaller again. So what's happened, like at the start of that push, the operators put as much dirt as in the blade as they can. So to, make, to change that blade load along the push, what's effectively happening is that material is being dropped out of the blade at the, at the pivot point. So what's happening as, as you go on through the days and, and shifts, well, you're getting a great big lump of material filling up through the pivot. Um, and the complaint about, if anyone who's done surveying before, about dozers knocking out your pivot points, uh, a lot of it's caused by that. You, you're continually having to cut and fill the pivot, even though that's not what you're supposed to do, but you have to because the material falls out of the blade at the pivot point. Um, in addition to that, you, you've got this continual churn where you're pushing it down, dropping it, and then having to pick it back up and push it. Um, the other thing is, looking at the premise of pushing down and then up again, you're basically, you're basically paying, when, you, when you're taking this material from here to here, which is flat, you're having to push all that down and then put all the energy back into it to go all the way back up again. So it's, a, it's not an efficient profile from that perspective either. So a bit of, a bit of new thinking um, in this process is what happens if you accept the rehandle and don't use a standard pivot point but straighten out all the push profiles. So profile number one is your, is your tip head pass, as we talked about before. Um, profile number two, and you can see that pivot point there is not the same in each pass, it's moving, it's dynamic. Profile number two is the start of your back stacks. So what you've done is, is that there is, you've filled the pivot, you're also changing it so you, you're actually cutting and filling material in there so there's a little bit of, of additional rehandle compared to filling the pivot. But every one of these pushes is straight, so the, the blade load that the operator picks up at the start is the same blade load they carry to the end. Um, at no stage are you pushing material down and then having to pay to put it back up again. Uh, so theoretically, if you run each of those slices through the productivity calculator, compared to doing it that way, you get about a 15% productivity gain by doing that. You, you pair that back by about 5% because of the extra rehandle, so theoretically you're 10% better off um, for keeping your pushes straight compared to looping down through the pivot point. On top of that 10%, you can then add the, the gains you get by, by not continually dropping and picking up material at the bottom, which is admittedly quite hard to quantify. Um, and you're in the order of sort of 15% better off by having um, straight pushes and pivot points that vary. Now the only problem with that is that anyone who's ever run a dozer push before knows that that's really difficult to manage. <laughs> pivot points are difficult to manage. Uh, let alone trying to do that. The, the only way that you can really do this is to, is to actually design each of these slices, turn them into a surface and load them into the machine as a, as a target surface for each slice. So the operator completes, completes one target surface before they can move to the next target surface. Um, and that way they, they can follow that. It's kind of a bit beyond the, beyond the, the survey pegs. So we'll just have a bit of a little bit of a talk about productivity. Um, I've touched on the design side of productivity. Uh, the big random factor in there is how good is your operator, um, and that 
uh, translate to, translates into a lot of the, the outcomes that you see in the field. <coughs> now according to Caterpillar, this little table on the right is some of the factors that you can find in the CAT handbook. According to Caterpillar, the difference between a poor operator and a good operator is about 40%. So these are factors that you basically multiply by the, by the rate that the, the dozers achieved in the sand pit in Milwaukee or wherever it is. So there's two components to that. Firstly, someone's pulling the levers. Um, how good is that person pulling the levers? Um, there is definitely a learning curve, but it's one of the easiest components to learn. Uh, after a few months, you, know, you can be pretty good at pulling the levers. One of the hardest things to learn is actually understanding the job and the, the push slices and what's going on. Um, and one of the continual frustrations is looking at, the, at a push from the high wall is you'll see dozers going all over the place doing all different things and it's very difficult to get everyone to be consistent. What tends to happen is dozers tend to be a stepping stone for other things. I don't know too many people who aspire to be a dozer driver for the rest of their lives. Um, so typically, you volunteer for the dozer if you want to get onto a digger in two years' time or you want to get onto a drag line or, or so forth. So you've got this continual churn of operators through the dozers um, and taking two years to understand the concept is not really ever going to get you to full productivity. Um, so what we recommend is, is one of the other benefits of doing this um, straight pushes and loading them slice by slice into the GPS is that straight away the, uh, the operator understands what they're doing. Uh, that's opposed to um, the old school of loading that surface in. So the dozer driver knows where they're going to get to, but they don't know how to get there. So one of the big things is, is fostering that understanding. How, do I, how am I actually going to get to this final position? Am I cutting above the pivot? Am I cutting through it? Am I tip heading the first pass? Or am I not tip heading the first pass? All those concepts, um, as you'll find out as you design your dozer pushes, change strip by strip, they change block by block, um, and it's very difficult for an operator to, to pick that up and be good at it in a short period of time. So after a couple of years, usually most people get it, but um, it's not really good enough to just leave it for two years uh, for someone to kind of feel their way through it in the field. I think we've got to be more proactive as an industry and um, be helping the, the operators understand the, um, the complexity of the plan through presenting plans in the GPS step by step. I've uh, just got a bit of a, this is just a screenshot, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's actually a rehab push. Um, there's a, we work with, a, with some partners, 3D Data Guidance, and they do um, some work basically doing push by push planning. Um, this is just a shot of a rehab job that they did at, at Mara. And it shows, and it's the, the map, the actual pictures off Google Maps, and the design is the design that they did that got loaded into the machine. So what the operator saw in the machine was these arrows basically and it showed them which material gets pushed to where and you can see that that you know pretty much everywhere the with the exception of that one there the the actual pushes follow the arrows exactly so you've got a really good compliance to plan in that case um, so there's two you get two things out of out of doing detailed planning and presenting it through the dozer push uh, through the gps and the dozer push the first thing you get out of it is um, the compulsion to think about it um, having sat down and having to work out a plan, typically you end up with something that's better than, than if you didn't work out a plan. And then on top of that, it gets communicated to the operator and they perform better than they would have done if they were just left to do their own thing. So you get a double benefit in doing these slice by slice push plans and whacking them through the, the GPS and the dozer. And I think that's actually all I've got to talk about. I'll just talk about this briefly for those that don't know, some of you do know, but um, so David and I, David's from 3D Data Guidance. Uh, we've got a, a little facility set up in Toowoomba. It's a scale um, pit. So I think it's one to, one to five. Uh, little bobcat set up as a dozer. You can see the little GPS um, pole set up. So it's got a full dozer guidance system in there. And we run a two day course up in Toowoomba where we run through some of the design concepts that we've been through today and, and a few other things. And, um, the idea is that you load your design into the dozer for that scale pit. You actually get out there and you get to have a go and you, you realise, oh, actually, you can't really do that. And um, it's great sort of practical feedback that, that really helps you understand what's going on. So there's a just gratuitous plug for our services. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's my end of my formal presentation. Um, 
at any stage in the future, if you've got any questions, just give me a call, I'll answer all your questions. Um, I'm happy to, happy to do that any time or drop me an email. I believe one of my business cards is in those folders that are sitting in front of you, so feel free to take that and um, if you um, have any questions in the future, 